very good morning to all of you teradhaniya university international research session ipers the signature annual conference of university of teradhaniya is scheduled to be held on 19th and 20th of august 2021 at the faculty of arts university of teradhaniya it promises to be a wonderful platform for researchers from a wide spectrum of disciplinary backgrounds to showcase their research outcomes this webinar is part of a series of pre ipers webinars organized by the ipers committee together with the international relations office of the university faculty of medicine organized this webinar under the title of covid-19 the global pandemic to disseminate the most updated research finding on covid-19 at the most appropriate time the webinar is going to moderate by professor sm pularatna professor sm pularatna is a senior professor and chair professor of medicine faculty of medicine university of peradeniya and consultant physician teaching hospital peradeniya he is an eminent researcher in the field of tropical medicine and infections of global relevance i invite professor sm kularatna to moderate the webinar over to you sir good morning everybody thank you very much professor mahatulge for kind words of introduction first of all i thank organizing committee of ipers special professor kalna madhuge from faculty of medicine for organizing this important timely webinar now in this region sri lanka india we are in a really a serious situation of covid so this is a timely webinar so today in this webinar we have invited two eminent virologists of international repute to share their knowledge about covid 19 and their application before starting the webinar i have to share few things about the program so each presentation will last for about 25 to 30 minutes and uh, then at the end of both presentation there will be question and answer time so audience can post their questions into chat box and then throughout the uh, webinar and this uh, question time will last for some time so let me introduce the first speaker professor shreyal malik peres he is a chair of virology the school of public health hong kong professor malik peres is a eminent virologist and has expertise about corona viruses he pioneered identification of sars cov virus in 2003 pandemic since then his research into corona virus found many facts hitherto unknown such knowledge helped immensely at the beginning of covid-19 pandemic in all aspects such as to understand the corona virus and the related epidemiology professor peres is a notable alumnus of university of peradeniya and actively involved in national covid-19 prevention program moreover he is a he is an author of over 600 research publications during past 35 years and he is the first sri lankan to be elected as a fellow of royal college of london professor peres was instrumental in many vital discoveries in influenza infection particularly bird flu so may i invite professor shreyal malik peres to do the presentation on covid covid 19 where it where did it come from and where it is going over to you professor peres Thank you, Professor Kolratna, for that introduction and uh, for inviting me to take part in this uh, uh, meeting. I hope you can see my slides now, and hope you can hear me as well. Yes, I can see. Yeah. 
So uh, what I will try to do is uh, where the virus came from very briefly, but more importantly, where it is going. And in particular, I think what we are all worried about now is the emergence of virus variants, which I will focus a lot of my talk on. But um, just to remind you uh, about viruses and, and this particular virus as well, this is a schematic of what it looks like. These uh, red uh, uh, blobs that you see is the spike protein of the virus that is important in attaching to the uh, host cell. Um, and this is a schematic of the virus particle. Uh, this is an infected cell. Uh, you can see on the surface, you see these uh, little black dots. These are virus particles budding out of the cell. And then this is a scanning electron micrograph. You can see, you know, hundreds of viruses coming out of just one infected cell. So it's important to understand that viruses can only replicate inside living cells. And in this case, we are talking about human cells. Right. So uh, there have been an coronaviruses infecting humans before. I mean, before SARS in 2003, uh, indeed from the 1960s, we knew that there were two human coronaviruses, 229E and OC43, infecting humans. They caused the common cold. People didn't pay much attention to it because it was believed to be very mild. Now that changed in 2003 with the emergence of SARS, which clearly was a very uh, lethal virus. And subsequent to that, we now know that there are two other coronaviruses, HKU1 uh, and uh, NL63, which are also endemic in humans. So, so basically, there are four coronaviruses that are present everywhere in the world, more or less, largely causing relatively mild disease. SARS came and went. It was very severe. MERS, as you know, emerged in the Middle East. It's still around there and is still a threat. But of course, COVID-19 is the most recent of the coronaviruses and it's caused a pandemic, as Professor Kularatna said. Now, where did this come from? Um, so this is a family tree of coronaviruses and in particular SARS 2003 and the COVID virus here. So with SARS 2003, we know very clearly where it came from. We know that the parent virus is present in bats, uh, uh, insect eating bat species called rhinolophus. Uh, these bat viruses got into small mammals in game animal markets in southern China, such as civet cats, uh, raccoon dogs and, and animals like that. And because humans were being continually exposed to these animals in the markets, the virus repeatedly jumped to humans and adapted to transmit in humans. Now, in the case of um, COVID-19, you can see that it is quite closely related to SARS of 2003. So it's called a Sabico virus in the same group, but it's distinct. Uh, and we also know that there are related viruses to COVID-19 in the same bat species of rhinolophus. Now, how it came from bats to humans is unclear. If you remember back in, uh, uh, end of two, 2019, there was this um, seafood market, which was a focus of a big cluster. And um, uh, one hypothesis is that, again, it may have come in that same pathway through small game animals into humans. But there is no absolute proof of that at the moment. And whether the virus came directly from bats to humans, we don't know. But the origin of the virus is very likely to be these same rhinolophus bats. Now, talking about the disease in humans, um, generally speaking, overall, certainly with the classical virus, I mean, before these new variants emerged, um, it was relatively mild in young people so that mortality was extremely uncommon and uh, uh, fatality rates progressively increased with age, as you can see here, and it was worse in males than in females. And of course, other underlying comorbidities would increase the, the risk of adverse outcomes, cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, uh, diabetes, renal disease, etc. And uh, recent studies on the immunology of uh, the progression and severity of disease suggest that 
a coordinated immune response, particularly of the T cell, uh, the, the CD4 and CD8 T cell components are important to contain the, the disease um, before or without it getting severe. And uh, there is evidence that with aging, there is a scarcity of naive T cells. So this is what is called immune senescence, meaning uh, most of, as we get older and older, most of our naive T cells get used up responding to various infections so that uh, there is a scarcity of naive T cells to respond to COVID-19. And there's evidence that this is correlated with the adverse severity of disease. Now, of course, it's a virus disease. So in the early stage of infection, you have a lot of virus uh, that uh, progressively gets contained by the innate immune response and then later the adaptive immune response. Um, but often the more severe complications arise later on in the disease. And that is at the time when the host inflammatory response, particularly the innate immune response, is kicking in. Um, so the, the ultimate outcome is a balance between the virus replication itself, the adaptive immune response, particularly the T cell and antibody responses, and then the host inflammatory responses, which may, of course, benefit, but also may harm the overall pathology. Um, so in order to tackle the viral replication, as you know, there have been many therapeutic drugs that have been tried um, I mean, hydroxychloroquine, lopinavir, ritonavir, and so many things. Um, uh, but of them, only remdesivir is, has any effect, and even that, not really an useful effect. Uh, there are monoclonal antibodies, not widely available in the world, but these may appear to, to have some effect. But overall, tackling the virus, we are not um, much better off at the moment. But as you know, uh, fortunately, there's at least one cheap and widely available drug, dexamethasone, which has been shown to be beneficial in controlling the host inflammatory response. And I would just emphasize to you that clinical trial, uh, the key clinical trial uh, from the UK, which showed that benefit. So this is very important to keep in mind the different um, uh, groups of patients. So if you look at patients who are, uh, require invasive mechanical ventilation, you can see that the dexamethasone treated group have much better outcomes, significantly better. When you look at milder patients who are oxygen dependent, again, there is a significant uh, improvement in clinical outcome. But if you look at those patients who do not require oxygen, meaning they are relatively mild, COVID patients. Uh, in this particular trial, there was no significant difference, but actually what you can see is that the signal is that dexamethasone, if anything, is making things worse. And this is very important to keep in mind. So the, the current recommendations do not recommend the indiscriminate use of dexamethasone in COVID patients. It's only for those who are oxygen dependent uh, or who have mechanical ventilation. And indeed, there's also theoretical evidence for this. So there's a nice study coming out of um, the United States where they looked at the uh, innate immune responses in patients with COVID-19 and patients with influenza and in controls. So of course, you have heard about this so-called cytokine storm and, and you may think that all COVID patients have this huge cytokine storm. So what they showed is that the most pronounce the most dramatic effect in COVID patients is a profound suppression of the interferon response. So it's actually a suppression of an important part of the innate immune system. Then they found there were two groups of patients. Uh, there was a few, you can see only about 4% who had this extreme inflammatory signatures. But the majority of them did not have this extreme inflammatory signatures. And indeed, their innate immune responses were no different to that of patients with influenza. And indeed, they had some lower levels of some of the cytokines compared to influenza. So this, uh, you can see, matches with the previous data that 
it is only those patients who have severe disease that will benefit from uh, immunomodulatory therapy such as dexamethasone. And, and it, you, you can potentially do harm by giving dexamethasone indiscriminately to everybody. Now, there's also a lot of uh, interesting data suggesting that there are some uh, genetic abnormalities in the interferon system, which is associated with increased severity. And also some of the patients uh, who have severe disease, about 13, 14% of them have autoantibodies to interferon. So these are all suggesting that um, severity of disease is linked up with aberrant or um, uh, mis uh, dysregulation of innate immune systems. Now, it's also from a practical point of view, it's important to keep in mind that infectiousness and transmission is primarily uh, occurring before the onset of clinical symptoms or in the first few days after the onset of clinical symptoms. So these red circles are clinical specimens uh, here in our studies in Hong Kong from whom you can culture virus and these black crosses are PCR positive samples, but which were culture negative. And you can see that, as you know, PCR can be positive for a long time, uh, but these patients may not necessarily be infectious. So the message is that just a positive PCR result does not mean the patient is infectious and infectious virus is found early in the illness. And uh, in those patients who have very high viral load, but of course, keep in mind that um, this shedding of infectious virus can be longer than this nine or 10 days in patients who are severely ill or those who are immunocompromised. Uh, now, how long does uh, immunity to COVID last? Uh, this uh, again is studies that we did in Hong Kong, and this is our overall patient population. And, and you can see this is over 200 days after the onset of clinical symptoms, the patients still have very good levels of neutralizing antibody. And this response, as one would expect, is uh, partially dependent on severity. So the most severely ill patients have a higher antibody response lasting for a longer time, but even mild patients do have uh, antibody responses, which we estimate will last for more than a year. Asymptomatic patients uh, do seem to have lower level immune response, which may uh, fade earlier. So they may require a particularly uh, vaccine if it is available. But keep in mind, of course, this is neutralizing antibody we are talking about. And even though the antibody responses may wane and become undetectable, it does not necessarily mean that you have no immunity at all. For example, we know that with hepatitis B vaccine, uh, you make a good antibody response after some years, it may be undetectable, but you still do have immunity. Um, and there are now increasing studies suggesting that patients who have been infected in the past are protected from reinfection. So this is a study from Denmark showing uh, in people who are infected, they're protected from reinfection in about 80% of the time. So of course, there is a minority of situations where, particularly with mild asymptomatic infection, where you may get reinfected. So it is um, recommended that if vaccine is widely available, that even patients who have recovered from COVID, particularly asymptomatic COVID, uh, to get one dose of uh, the vaccine. It is also clear now that um, in those who have been infected in the past, one dose is all that is needed because giving a second dose to these people do not necessarily boost the antibody responses much higher. Now, I want to turn to another aspect, and, and that is, of course, when you look at the number of cases reported from different parts of the world, what we are talking about is confirmed cases uh, by PCR. But uh, it is very likely that actually there's much more infection going on than is confirmed uh, as cases. So the only way to find that out is to do antibody studies. So that is zero epidemiology because antibody, once you get infected, the antibody, as I showed you, will come up and then it will remain detectable for many months or even years. And this is a, a meta-analysis or a systematic review of all zero epidemiological studies that had been done. And this is still the end of last year, more or less. 
And what you can see, the, the redder the color, uh, the higher the zero prevalence. And here, particularly from India, you can see that, um, that there is um, a zero prevalence of 10 to 50 percent. I mean, in some parts of India, particularly around Mom, uh, Mumbai, the zero prevalence was about 50 percent. And then, although you can't see this data in detail, from this data, you can, you can look at what is the ratio between the reported cases and the actual incidence of infection based on zero prevalence studies. Overall, across all these parts of uh, the US, Europe, and, and South uh, Asia, it is around six or seven times, meaning the reported case numbers, it's seven times that that is actually infected. So what we are seeing is just a tip of the iceberg. But in particular, look at this data from India. On average, it is 50 times. So, and this is, mind you, beginning of uh, end of last year. Not It doesn't take into account the current situation. So as of end of last year, India was um, probably having 50 times the number of cases uh, it had formally reported uh, being infected. Now, of course, what this also means is that uh, people with these high infection rates, in theory, should be protected from reinfection. And this is where there is concern, you know, particularly about the huge outbreak in, in areas such as uh, Mumbai. But I'll come back to that later. So now I'll talk about the mutants. So we talked about virus replicating inside cells and when the viral RNA replicates, uh, there are mutations that are introduced. Now, and this is because the RNA replication does not have a kind of a spell check mechanism to correct any errors. So you do have uh, mutations occurring and this is true for all RNA viruses like influenza, HIV, etc. But most of these mutations are bad for the virus and the viruses do not survive, so we don't see it. Some, Many of them have no real biological effect, so we do see them if you sequence the virus, but they are not of any significance. But they're useful for tracking the virus to see who gave the virus to whom. But it's only a minority of these mutations that do give the virus some advantage, either in terms of transmission, uh, or in terms of escaping antibody response. And these are the ones that uh, we are worried about as variants of uh, concern. So, of course, uh, these virus variants, it was inevitable as, I mean, uh, with more than 140 million humans being infected, it was inevitable that the virus was going to change over time. And, um, I mean, this has, of course, caused a fair bit of concern. I mean, you have to keep in mind that... Uh, uh, now, we talk about the UK mutant and the South African mutant, but, you know, the, the places where the mutant is first reported may not be the place where it started, because the, the rate of sequencing in different parts of the world is, is very different. So these are issues that we need to keep in mind. Now, the whole thing is quite complicated, but just to illustrate it very simply, this is a nice figure that I saw in The Economist. So if you look at the original Wuhan virus here, you can see that over time, the virus became diversified into these different clades. And, and then we have particularly this clade B1, which uh, became dominant. And you can see that some of these, you have some of these mutations in red and in blue. And these are some of the viruses of interest. So this is the South African virus here. This is the UK virus down here. Uh, and um, the Brazilian virus here. So you can see the virus has evolved and diversified, but only a few of these have given rise to mutations of biological significance. So let us, um, now, and most of these mutations of biological significance are primarily mutations on the spike protein. And that is because this is the cell as you know, the ACE2 receptor is the, the receptor that binds the, the virus. And it's a spike protein of the virus that binds to this ACE2 receptor. So in particular, it is mutations on this spike protein, particularly in this part of the spike protein here on this, the top of it, that is likely to either affect the binding, increase the binding, 
and also uh, will be relevant for antibodies because antibody neutralizing antibodies bind to this part of the spike protein and prevent the uh, attachment to the cell. So again, mutations in this part of the spike protein is likely to be relevant in escape from antibody. Right, so when we talk about the B117 or the, the, vi the virus first detected in the United Kingdom, it had acquired quite a number of mutations, 23 indeed. Um, um, but there were just a couple which were biologically important. And, and one of these is this um, uh, 501Y mutation. And this is now known to increase the binding of the spike to the receptor binding uh, to the receptor and therefore increase efficiency of infection. So at the epidemiological level, we know that it is 50 to 70 times more transmissible than the previous virus. There is higher viral load. Uh, it is believed to have some impact on severity, but luckily the good news is that there is no escape from antibody immunity. So whether you get past infection or vaccine, uh, the, the, this variant will not uh, give you more problems by escaping immunity. Now, this particular mutant also does, because in addition to the, the 501 mutation, it has some other deletions in, in parts of the spike, which may give rise to a negative, a false negative in some PCR assays. Uh, and this is what is called the S, uh, the S drop. Right. And, and this, you can see the, the efficiency of transmission. Now, once this virus got to Denmark, uh, you can see back in December, this red part is the variant virus. These other colors are different, other, other viruses, other variants. You can see at the beginning, it was very, very small proportion of the total. And then just within two months, the, the B117 variant became dominant. And, and this is obviously because it is more transmissible. And they have done um, followed up household trials, uh, households which are cases and, and looked at the secondary attack rate. And they can show that the B117, the transmission to other members of the household is 1.5 to 1.7 times greater than the other viruses. So it is significantly more transmissible. Then there is another variant which also emerged around the same time, end of last year, in South Africa. Um, and this is what is called the B1351 variant. Now that again has this same 501 mutation. Mind you, this is independently arising. This is not the UK virus that has got to South Africa. And now it has a second mutation, this 484. And this one is important because it reduces the neutralizability of the virus by patients sera, patients who have recovered from infection, and also patients who have been vaccinated. Now, reduced, it not completely lost, but reduced. So potentially having some impact on vaccine efficacy. Now, again, you can see it's the yellow virus here, and this is back in September. You can just begin to see this variant in South Africa, and then very rapidly within two or three months, you can see it's taking over. So it is also better transmission. So again, uh, quite a concerning situation. Then the third, again, around the same time, was a variant virus that emerged in Brazil in, in an area called Manaus. And interestingly, this area had been hit very badly in the first wave, meaning about 50% of the population were already supposed to be immune by antibody testing. But in that population, there was a second wave, which was worse than the first. And again, that uh, uh, infection was caused again by a third variant, which is called uh, this um, uh, 501B3, whatever it is. Again, you can see this 501 mutation and this 484K mutation. And you see the same story, the variant very low at the beginning uh, in, uh, in December, and then within two or three months, it becomes dominant. So uh, again, another variant which is able to transmit faster and seems to be able to evade uh, antibody responses. And here I'm showing you the data for why we say uh, some of these viruses can escape antibody responses to some extent. Now, this is uh, uh, patients who are immunized with 
two vaccines. I mean, this is the uh, the, the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, but it doesn't matter, but you know, basically they, these are people who should be protected and having neutralizing antibody. So this is to the older virus and uh, each one is a different patient, different serum. And when you have the B117, the UK variant, you can see very similar. So no loss of protective efficacy with the UK variant. But if you look at the South African variant, you can see that every single serum is losing many folds, about 10 folds of neutralizing capacity uh, with the South African virus. It's not gone. It's not completely lack of protection, but it is reduced. And here you can see the same thing with this other vaccine. So this is what I mean by the concern of particularly the South African and the uh, Brazilian variants in terms of reducing the capacity of vaccines to protect. But, but again, um, it's not complete lack of it. And indeed, even from vaccine trials now in South Africa, there is evidence that vaccines that had very good efficacy in North America or in the UK have lower protection uh, in South Africa because of the variant. Then, of course, closer to Sri Lanka, we, as you know, India is having a huge um, resurgence, second wave of COVID at the moment. And uh, there's also uh, what is called the double mutant or, and also the triple mutant. But so now again, uh, it has particularly probably two important mutations, but you can see this 484 again. It's not exactly the same as the um, South African or the Brazilian, but it's in the same place. So there is reason to believe that there may, that this may have some effect on uh, neutralization capacity. Uh, and this other mutation, 454, 452, uh, has been shown in mutants arising in the United States to give increased transmissibility. So there is reason to believe that this um, uh, variant that is found, the so-called double mutant that people are talking about found in India, uh, does have increased capacity to transmit and may have um, some capacity to escape antibody responses. Although very recently, just two or three days ago, there was a study from India showing that it didn't, it wasn't that much of a loss of antibody response, but I think that is left to be seen. So let me just summarize there um, as to particularly where is this virus going uh, in terms of the viral variants. As I said, the B117 or the virus first uh, discovered in the UK, the, the South African variant, the Brazilian variant, and also uh, one in North America, they increase virus transmission. So it is not surprising. The virus is adapting to transmit more efficiently in humans. Um, and as I told you, this common mutation seems to enhance binding uh, of this virus spike to the receptor. Um, and uh, some of these, not the UK variant, but some of these others do have mutations that may compromise um, uh, immunity by arising from past infection or from vaccination. And indeed, I told you that in Brazil, the the variant virus emerged in a population which had very high uh, prior infection uh, immunity um, uh, rates. And as I mentioned, vaccines do have compromised effectiveness, but overall, they do seem to at least protect against fatality. So they are not useless. So the news is bad, but not uh, as bad as, as it could be. Um, since these are mutations that are taking place, you do have to keep in mind that you have to keep um, be alert that some uh, PCR tests might be affected in terms of sensitivity. But since most laboratories use at least two different targets, it is unlikely that you'll miss it altogether. Um, but having said all this, it's important to remember that all these variant viruses transmit by essentially by the same routes and the social distancing measures that we used successfully in the past will work. Uh, the virus stability on surfaces is similar. Uh, the only thing is because of the increased transmissibility, you really have to work much harder to achieve the same level of control. Um, and um, 
given that there are millions of human infections, the more infections you have, whether it be globally or within your own country, uh, you are giving the virus more chance to mutate and, and evade. So the most effective way of reducing variant emergence is to reduce the amount of virus transmission. In the future, uh, we will need to update vaccines from time to time to cover these new variants. Uh, but as I said, the best way to contain and control these variants is to reduce the numbers of cases globally. And I think uh, I just want to end that uh, one thing that uh, we all really should learn about this virus, I mean, we should have learned about it a long time ago, is that beware of complacency. I mean, uh, this is not a virus that you think you have conquered and you can relax. I I'm afraid we have to be continually vigilant and continually on our guard uh, with this virus. So with that, I will end and uh, uh, look forward to uh, Professor Malavige's talk, and then we'll be happy to take questions. Over. Thank you very much, Professor Firis, for that excellent update. So you have been presenting uh, to the audience uh, of new updates about the present problem that we are facing. So thank you very much once again. And uh, please stay with us and we will go to the question uh, time after the next presentation. Let me introduce the second uh, presentation by Professor Nilika Malavige. Uh, Professor Nikka Malavige is a professor and head of the Department of Immunology and Molecular Medicine at the University of Jawadhanapura and an academic visitor at the MRC Human Immunology Unit, University of Oxford. She is also a member of the Executive Committee of the National Society of Infectious Disease. She has done pioneering work on dengue and currently involved with COVID-19 virology. And uh, Professor Malaviki actually is really actively involved in sharing about the current COVID epidemic of over the last uh, one year with all, all of us, especially medical profession as well as the public. So let me invite Professor Nikka Malaviki to present that uh, her talk actually magic bullet in the pandemic over to you professor malavigi uh, thank you sir for that introduction and uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, talk about vaccines uh, because i believe that uh, all the healthcare workers are to receive their second dose very soon uh, uh, this week end of this week if not early next week and also since uh, we are experiencing uh, the beginning of a bad situation uh, and the beginning itself uh, doesn't seem to be good. So I can just, yeah, just move my slides. Let me stuck a little bit. Okay. Okay. So uh, now as far as vaccines are concerned, uh, now how are we doing with uh, compared to the rest of the world. Uh, I, I know we don't uh, seem to have uh, immunized a large proportion of our, of our population, uh, but, but as of 24th of April, we have immunized 4.3% of our population. That is given one dose of, uh, of a vaccine to 4.32 of our population, uh, which is similar to most countries, of course. And of course, uh, uh, Africa is lagging far behind with uh, certain countries in Middle East, uh, but uh, Although we could do very much better uh, as far as vaccines are concerned, uh, we are compared, our vaccination rates are comparable to most um, uh, South Asian and Southeast Asian countries, but of course not, uh, uh, we are not doing as great as the West. We stopped our vaccination program on the 8th of April, uh, merely because of, we, we ran out of vaccines and uh, a certain amount had to be kept uh, for, for the second dose for healthcare workers and other frontline workers. Now, uh, of course, uh, when we compare the proportion of the population fully vaccinated against COVID, of course, Israel is leading uh, the, the, with uh, 
they have almost vaccinated, fully vaccinated about 60% of their population with uh, several other countries uh, coming behind uh, with United Kingdom uh, having immunized about 19% of their population and so on. India has ad, ad, uh, is the second largest country to have administered vaccines. Uh, they have uh, administered almost over 100 million vaccines, but they have only fully vaccinated uh, 1.6% of their population as of uh, 23rd of April, because of course we know that India has a population of 1.3 or 1.4 billion uh, individuals. And vaccines do work. Uh, this is the situation in Israel, uh, where uh, after starting uh, immunizations and after achieving uh, quite a significant proportion of uh, immunizing a significant proportion of their population, the, uh, the number of cases, the new critically ill individuals and daily deaths have significantly reduced. And of course, uh, uh, as this is data from day before yesterday. So they have only about two, two deaths per day uh, and very few critically ill patients. So vaccines do seem to be uh, doing, doing their job. Uh, and the few cases that are being seen in, in Israel is uh, because of the South African strain, because as, as uh, Professor Malik said, uh, the South African strain is a variant of concern because uh, of particular mutations that evade immunity, in, including vaccine immunity. And uh, uh, so when we look at uh, the Southeast Asian region, uh, this is the WHO data as of 23rd of April, uh, most of the uh, WHO region, uh, the Southeast Asian region, are using the Covishield vaccine, um, which was actually gifted from uh, India to many of the countries in, in uh, around the region. And also uh, Sri Lanka bought uh, the Covishield vaccine from India and was gifted from the COVAX. Uh, and uh, countries like Nepal are using Sinopharm and uh, uh, Maldives and, and Nepal uh, but the other, other countries are uh, sticking to the official vaccine uh, given through. Uh, and also India is having this co-vaccine, which is uh, inactivated vaccine developed by Bharat Biotech. It is still undergoing phase three clinical trials and not used in any other country as of yet, uh, because it is not registered and have, uh, is coming to the end of the phase three clinical trials. Now, um, now this is of, as of 18th of April, and today we are 27th of April, and the situation is very different in, in Sri Lanka. But this is, um, is a moment when we are seeing a rapid rise in the number of cases in the whole region, including India, uh, Nepal, uh, uh, so, uh, in Thailand. I mean, Thailand was doing really good uh, all this time, but now it's uh, Thailand also seems to be affected. And so the whole region seems to be having a rapid rise in the number of cases. And um, we have just seen the beginning of this in Sri Lanka with the rapid rise. So uh, I, I know uh, when you look at the, and speak to our colleagues managing all the COVID hospitals, um, designated COVID hospitals, I'm not talking about intermediate care centers, uh, we are already full. Uh, so uh, it is a great situation when we are already full at the beginning of, of this outbreak. Now, uh, as far as vaccines are going, so I, I don't think I can be covering all the vaccines because there are so many COVID vaccines. So I think uh, because of the interest of time and I think uh, most uh, individuals who are listening in would want to know uh, how protected they are from the single dose that they got and uh, the, the vaccine they will be getting and, and what are the side effects. I'll be basically talking about the uh, AstraZeneca uh, Covishield vaccine. Uh, and uh, so we have several WHO approved vaccines uh, by now, including the Pfizer, the AstraZeneca vaccine developed by AstraZeneca and Covishield. Uh, then uh, the, uh, we've got the Moderna, uh, and the uh, Johnson and Johnson, and the, the they have given timelines uh, for approval of the one of the Sinopharm vaccines as the end of April, uh, and Sinovac, uh, Sinovac as the end of April, and uh, there is no current date for the approval of uh, Sputnik. The Sputnik data has been uh, the phase three interim data analysis has been published, but uh, the WHO has not given a date for. Uh, the approval for Sputnik, because uh, according to uh, their data, uh, the, what is up on their website, they are awaiting more data for Sputnik before they can uh, decide on a date uh, that they can uh, give registration. So, uh, 
now when we think about vaccines i think the big questions are uh, which ones are the best are we getting the best vaccines can we get the best vaccines um, what are the uh, side effect profile how safe it is uh, to get the second dose because after we got the first dose of uh, the covid shield vaccine only uh, these uh, rare side effects of thrombosis emerged uh, the protection from a single dose because the healthcare workers will be getting their second dose uh, very soon but a large number of the population would not be getting it immediately and of course now uh, we do have a variant here which is the uk variant v117 which uh, professor malik explained uh, all this time about the significance of the v117 uh, as far as transmissibility is concerned so we do have a variant and and how effective is the vaccine against the variant he did say uh, uh, the, there is no immune escape against the b117 but how is it with with one single dose. Uh, now, when we are comparing vaccines uh, to see which one is good, uh, it, it is uh, although we, it's sometimes difficult to do a direct comparison because the study protocols, the primary endpoints, uh, the study settings, the, the the type of variants circulating at the time of the when the study was going on, the the epidemiology of the virus and the incidence of infections in various countries differed. Um, when these uh, vaccines were rolled out. So, but give, given uh, the uh, available data, there is this beautiful analysis uh, in Lancet uh, showing that the, the efficacy rates of Pfizer and Moderna are some, uh, somewhere between 95 and 94%. Uh, the Sputnik is around 91%, and the Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca is around 67%. So that is the efficacy. Uh, but then another way of looking at vaccines is the number needed to treat uh, to reduce infection or, or symptomatic infection. And uh, so for the number needed to treat is, is a little bit higher for Pfizer and for the Sputnik, uh, less for Moderna. And uh, the number needed to treat is less for the Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca. So that there are two ways of looking at uh, vaccines. And again, it's difficult to do a head-to-head -head comparison. And when we look at our situation, uh, so we have been, we have given, I believe, 925,000 something vaccines. And of course, uh, 326,000 uh, have been given to healthcare workers and frontline essential service providers. So we do have a second dose left uh, for these group of individuals. And, uh, uh, and the vaccines, uh, the second dose will be rolled out. I mean, it's been given to the uh, Colombo uh, Municipality Council uh, medical and other healthcare staff today. And I, I believe it will be rolled out immediately uh, all over Sri Lanka to cover this group of individuals. So there are second doses to give these individuals immediately. And uh, after how the rest of the vaccines were given was like uh, about 350,000 something were given to uh, individuals below the age of uh, 60. And uh, for individuals above the age of 60, it was uh, 248,000. And uh, uh, individuals, so that is from the coffee sheet gifted by the, uh, by the government of India and what was purchased subsequently. But uh, then we got a donation from COVAX. And from that, that was exclusively uh, based on the priority list. So that went to the uh, individuals over 60 years of age. So this is how we have been doing with vaccine, how, how vaccines are concerned. And I thought uh, you'd be interested to see how our immune responses are and uh, what is the sort of protection uh, with a single dose of the COVID shield vaccine. Uh, Professor Malik showed how, a sing how the uh, two doses of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines uh, were effective against the, uh, the V117 and the South African variant. But how does a single dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine uh, efficacy uh, against, against the original uh, virus and the variants? And what are the T cell responses like? So uh, we, this is currently under review. Uh, and so this is just showing uh, the, the, uh, the zero conversion rates in different age groups. So we had sort of similar numbers, about 100, 150 in, in uh, these age groups. But uh, because there are very few healthcare workers above the age of 60, these are university academics, uh, uh, of course. Uh, so above the age of 60, we have a, a small sample population over 60. But basically, we had good zero conversion rates uh, in the younger age groups, uh, uh, ranging from around 90% uh, to 98%, uh, and, and a little bit less uh, in the over 60 age group with uh, 
uh, around 82% zero conversion after one single dose. So this is at, at uh, 28 to 32 years, so at 30 days after giving a single dose of the Covishield vaccine. And so these are the antibody levels. So these are the total antibody levels. Uh, so this assay actually measures IgG, IgM, and IgA. And as you can see in different age groups, uh, uh, the, 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 because of the reduction in the mean antibody teeters in the 30 to 39 age group, for some reason they had a, uh, the number of individuals who did not zero convert and low antibody, had low antibodies were in that age group. Uh, uh, there was a significant difference between age groups. But when in our healthcare workers, uh, we had a different group who were infected. So we had 26 healthcare workers who had been infected with the uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 and then received one dose of the uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, the vaccine. And everybody, of course, there was 100% zero conversion. And as you can see, the antibody levels in those who uh, in, in individuals who were infected and received one dose of the vaccine were very much higher. Uh, significantly higher than when you compared to uh, the naive individuals who received one dose of the vaccine. And the T-cell responses. So Professor Malik explained the importance of the T-cell responses uh, and, and uh, that if you have a good robust T-cell response to the virus and even early in disease, you tend to have mild infection. And, uh, and, and also with the variants, uh, because T-cells cover a very huge amount of epitopes and unlike the, the neutralizing antibodies which would cover three or four epitopes the t-cell response covers a large very broad range of epitopes uh, e uh, even if you might not have a good antibody response to a particular variant if you have good t-cell responses you might be okay uh, so uh, when, when we look at uh, so we had we tested uh, t-cell responses by early spots against all of uh, overlapping pools of the spike protein so this is the S1 pool, which is the first bit of the spike protein covering the first bit and, and the S2 pool covering the next bit. And uh, as you can see, so we didn't have any infected individuals here. These are all naive individuals. So after the vaccine, the T-cell responses significantly increased. There were some individuals who did not make T-cell responses, but over 40% uh, over of individuals had uh, good T-cell responses. And these T-cell responses were not age dependent. Young individuals and old individuals were equally uh, had had equal uh, frequency of uh, T cell responses uh, to to the uh, early part of the spike protein and the uh, latter part of the spike protein. So that is quite good news. Now coming to this variant, um, so uh, I think even without uh, any any viral data. I think just by looking at the epidemiology of what is happening in Sri Lanka, we can find out that something is uh, wrong here. Because all this time, uh, when we had a large number of cases, so for instance, when we had like 900,000 cases in December, our hospitals were not full and our ICUs were not full and there were not so many oxygen dependent patients. And uh, we now see a, a, a quite a bit difference with our ICUs uh, full, our new I ICUs allocated, our COVID hospitals full and more patients dependent on oxygen. So even without any virology data, uh, I, I think uh, we, we can figure it out that something else is happening here. And uh, when we look at this, our previous virus and this B117, uh, yeah, all the uh, so uh, this particular virus gives this a drop in the PCR. Uh, so you know that this is here. Uh, uh, so you can use that as a screening test also. So uh, now we know that this is the one that is here. We confirmed yesterday. But uh, when you take the Kalambu and Kurunagala data, because uh, that, that is the all, uh, initial data we have right now, about 95% of the samples, positive samples, are because of this variant. So it seems that it has spread very fast in Sri Lanka and it has, seems to have replaced our previous variant faster than what was seen in other countries. And of course, uh, Professor Malik said that it has a higher, uh, higher transmission rate. And of course, whether it's associated with higher mortality or not is a question. There is this nature paper showing that it actually increases mortality uh, this, uh, uh, compared to these uh, other variants. Uh, but it is this paper, this is community study, which shows that it increases mortality. There are other papers showing that it doesn't increase mortality. But I think what actually does increase mortality is a mismatch 
between the supply and demand. So as soon as uh, there is a high, large number of cases and we have a, uh, uh, we can't cater to the large, uh, large number of cases, that would lead to a higher mortality irrespective of uh, what variant we are looking at. And uh, of course, the South African variant, we did see it in Sri Lanka, but only in quarantine. Uh, so this is not so far a threat in Sri Lanka. Now, uh, so apart from the looking at the total antibody responses, we did this hat assay where uh, in collaboration with Oxford Day Centers, uh, they have developed this assay. And we looked at the antibody responses to the initial virus, where I called it, we called it wild type, against the B117 and the B1, uh, sorry, this is a, a, the, the 351, the South African variant. And as you can see, the, uh, the antibody responses to the uh, B117, which is a UK variant, which is what is circulating in Sri Lanka currently, following one single dose of the vaccine is significantly lower than to the uh, original uh, virus uh, virus trait. And of course, uh, but, but of course it is very, very much stronger. The, the antibody levels are much higher than to the South African strain where after a single dose, uh, most of the individuals had hardly any antibody responses uh, to neutralize, uh, to, to uh, that bind to the receptor binding domain of the South African variant. But the story was different in people who were already infected. So these are the 20 antibody responses of the 26 people who already were infected and got a vaccine. So uh, they had good responses, much, much higher teeters. So if you look at the x-axis of this graph and the x-axis of this graph, they had very high antibody teeters uh, to the original virus. And also the antibody teeters to the B117 UK virus uh, was, was not changed. I mean, it was similar to the uh, wild type. So this is, uh, so the people who already had an infection when they were given one dose of the vaccine, it acted as a booster dose or a second dose. And so the antibody responses to the B117 was similar, there was no difference, but of course, they too had a significantly lower um, antibody response to the B351, uh, which is the South African variant. And so apart from that, we wanted to also look at uh, the antibody binding to the uh, to, to the site where there is blocking to the uh, binding to the ACE2 receptor. So we use this surrogate neutralizing assay because we don't have BSL3 facilities to actually carry out a proper uh, neutralizing assay with a live virus. We use the surrogate neutralizing antibody test. And of course, uh, the individuals who were not infected had significantly higher antibody responses after I mean, uh, positive antibody responses. But these are the 26 individuals who were infected. And as you can see, although some individuals did were infected with COVID PCR positive, some of the healthcare workers did not have antibodies uh, before uh, vaccination, uh, they, were, uh, they were antibody negative, but they zero converted uh, antibody negative in the sense they were antibody positive, but didn't have antibodies that uh, new, uh, that bind bind to the S2 uh, receptor blocking antibodies. But after a single dose of the vaccine, everybody had uh, good antibody levels, and so this is the uh, in, uh, naive individuals after one dose. Uh, the correlation between the uh, uh, antibodies to the wild type virus and the uh, sorry uh, earlier virus and the total antibody showing a good correlation and these are the infected individuals so as you can see uh, most of the individuals uh, who had previous infection had uh, sort of lower antibody levels and with one dose the, the antibody levels shift to this corner with a very strong immune response so when you compare this uh, the individuals with one single dose who were not previously infected with the individuals who were previously infected and received one dose, you can see that they have a very good antibody response uh, and, uh, and which blocks binding to the S2 receptor, uh, which is very promising. So as Professor Malik said, those who had infection, uh, one dose of the COVID, uh, COVID shield vaccine seems to be uh, uh, doing, their, doing its job for this, but there was of course this one individual who didn't have uh, good responses. This is the pre-response of this individual, which shifted a little bit there, but again, uh, that individual was not very good at responding. Uh, and uh, the question is, of course, uh, I, uh, when was the second dose due? Because when, when people were vaccinated in January, based on that evidence, um, and according to the manufacturer's leaflet, it was best to give it at four, four I mean, it was like four, four weeks or 28 days. But then emerging evidence showed uh, that the vaccine efficacy is higher 
then you give it at around 12 weeks which uh, is is being done so all of you are getting i think the dose at 12 weeks uh, which is good and uh, then of course how does the astrazeneca compare to the pfizer why can't we get the pfizer and, and are we getting an inferior thing now that's that's a question and this is a study a preprint uh, available in the uk again symptomatic infection uh, with one single dose of of, uh, of the astrazeneca vaccine uh, compared to uh, those who had uh, covid and uh, post second dose uh, the pfizer so compare so one dose of uh, Astra, the AstraZeneca vaccine uh, did reduce symptoms uh, significantly, but not as much as two doses of the, of the Pfizer vaccine or after uh, when compared to those with previous infection. And uh, so when you compare to the viral loads of those who got one dose of the Pfizer uh, AstraZeneca, they, they don't have data for two doses of AstraZeneca because the second dose of AstraZeneca was only given very recently in the UK as well because of the 12 week, uh, uh, 12 week gap between the two vaccines. So uh, when you look at one dose of the uh, two doses of the Pfizer versus natural infection, it is similar. So getting two doses of Pfizer is similar to being naturally infected with um, with COVID as far as uh, a reduction in in, uh, in infection rates, CT values or viral loads, and uh, and the symptoms are concerned. Uh, but after one dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, the the risk of uh, infection and the viral loads and the symptoms significantly fell, but not as much as getting natural COVID or two doses of Pfizer. And now I think the concern is about, okay, how safe is it? Uh, all these thrombosis uh, problems. In Sri Lanka, we did have six individuals who developed this complication of thrombotic thromb thrombocytopenia. And we know that three individuals died. Uh, and uh, so people are still trying to find out uh, the what is the type of individuals who get this complication, which is not known. But this uh, New England Journal of Medicine paper uh, showed that uh, individuals who developed this complication actually did have antibodies to PF4. And because of there was platelet activation, and that could have led to all the complications seen uh, uh, as a result of that. So the symptoms that occur when, when people do get this cere cerebral venous sinus thrombosis or uh, portal vein thrombosis. Uh, so so there are, there's a profile of uh, things that, uh, a, a variety of uh, problems that people can get, is a new or severe headache, which is not helped by the usual uh, type of painkillers or getting worse. Uh, and the headache that seems worse when lying down or bending over, and which is associated with blurred vision, nausea, vomiting, um, difficulty with your speech, mm -hmm. uh, weakness or drowsiness, and uh, of course, chest pain, shortness of breath, leg swelling, uh, persistent abdominal pain. So uh, those those were the symptoms of concern. Uh, and uh, I think none of the healthcare workers uh, hopefully developed all of these things, So, uh, which is good news. So the question is whether the risk is higher with the second dose. Uh, uh, again, uh, based on the data, uh, so the UK has not put out this data, but this data was uh, available in the Australian Medical Association regulators. And uh, after 2 million doses of the second dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine in the UK, with 2 million doses, uh, one person has developed it. So the incidence appears to be much lower because according to the EMA, which is the European Medical Association, which is the regulatory authority for the European Union, the incidence of uh, vaccine induced immune thrombocyto uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenia is around one in 100,000 uh, and the diagnostic criteria. Uh, so you see with the Johnson and Johnson as well. So which is again an adenoviral vector vaccine and uh, which occurs between four to 30 days uh, following uh, the immunization. So you get venous or arterial thrombosis, uh, thrombocytopenia and a, a positive PF4 uh, antibodies uh, by ELISA. And so what is the risk of getting the vaccine versus uh, risk of getting COVID? So this is, uh, uh, so they have done a risk profile uh, based on age and, uh, and exposure level. So this is uh, individuals at high risk exposure, which I believe hospital healthcare workers are individuals who are at high risk of exposure. And so this is the risk of hospitalizations uh, at different age groups. So of course, the older you are, 
the higher risk of uh, hospitalizations. Uh, so the number of hospitalizations prevented by uh, the, prevented by giving a vaccine versus the uh, chance of developing a blood clot. So the blood clots were seen in young individuals. So the the uh, the proportion of in, uh, this uh, the blood clots developing was higher in young individuals versus old individuals. But so you have to weigh the risk benefit. So uh, for in high high risk settings. What they have recommended is the risk of getting uh, thrombosis is far less when you compare to the risk of hospitalization and, and uh, CBDCs. And uh, now, although for the AstraZeneca, there were sort of equal proportion of males and females developing this uh, this, this issue, uh, for the Johnson and the Johnson, it appears to be different. So uh, for the Johnson and Johnson, uh, 15, uh, uh, this uh, vaccine induced thrombotic effects have been uh, incidences have been reported in in the USA so this is the CDC data and all of them were in the females and uh, none of them in the in, in the males and all of them have occurred in uh, females uh, less than uh, 60, 65 years and, and predominantly in this age group uh, so this is the Johnson and Johnson data uh, for the AstraZeneca the, there was no uh, uh, gender difference, although it was more in the females, and, and they think it's more in the females because more females receive the vaccine. Uh, so so they're not really uh, uh, think uh, for the AstraZeneca, there is a female thing, but uh, the, they're still analyzing. And so the future of COVID vaccines, of course, uh, how effective will they be against these emerging variants? So I hope we won't get any more variants uh, apart from the ones we have, but we know that India has a variant of interest and whether whether how bad that variant is and whether it's a variant of concern is, is still a big question. How long the immunity will last and whether or how frequently we should be given the booster dose and to whom yeah, is another question because Pfizer, of course, announced that they're already uh, developing, uh, having their uh, uh, updated vaccine uh, to be given in summer. So whether it should be given to everybody uh, is a, uh, and who should it be given to is, is a big question. So because I presented our vaccine data, I would just like to tell, uh, show all the faces because it was a huge study. Uh, we, got, we got samples from every and it's a huge amount of work to do in that short time. So Chandimuji Vandara uh, played a huge role in it with all the other members in our lab. And I would like to thank our collaborators uh, from Oxford. Um, uh, it was Alan Townsend's lab who developed all these uh, head assays for uh, looking at various antibody responses to various variants. Uh, our collaborators from the Colombo Municipality Council, uh, Dr. Sita Samarvira, uh, Chief Epidemiologist, who was, uh, who was uh, played a big role in helping in the study, and all, all our funders. Uh, uh, so, thank you for listening and most happy to take questions. Thank you, Professor Nilika Malagui, for your excellent update. I think uh, uh, all Sri Lankans are actually waiting to get that type of update about the current uh, vaccine and its safety and the efficacy, especially medical profession. So thank you very much again for your participation in this webinar. And, uh, and uh, now uh, the question time. And there are many questions came in the chat box for both uh, Professor Malik Piris as well as Professor Malike. And I found you have answered to most of these questions in your presentation, right? But there are some questions I thought those are important, right? One question is uh, the, the interaction of uh, AstraZeneca vaccine and the other vaccinations, for example, like uh, tetanus vaccine or antirabies vaccine, and the people are having actually this problem, whether it's safe to get these two vaccines in a very, very close proximity. What's the answer for that? So, Malik, would you like to go ahead? Yeah. Uh, yes, I mean, so, I mean, obviously, it, it would be sensible not to take two vaccines on the same day if you can avoid it. But in, in theory, there shouldn't be any major interaction between them. 
but if you have a choice, uh, it would make sense to defer one vaccine, uh, at least by a couple of weeks. But uh, Nidika, I think there is a specific recommendation, right, from Sri Lanka or what? Yeah, and, and so, so I think there is no specific recommendation as such from Sri Lanka because I think um, quite a few people uh, get get uh, various cut injuries and specifically I think the most of the questions were about the rabies vaccine because in uh, other than other countries in Sri Lanka we get a lot of uh, people bitten by dogs and you have to give the rabies vaccine. And uh, so, uh, so it, there were instances where people had the COVID shield vaccine the week before, and whether you can give the rabies vaccine is not a question of whether you, you should can give the rabies vaccine. Uh, the rabies vaccination is, is a priority because we know that that's hundred percent mortality. Uh, so, uh, so if you can keep a gap, it is good for the tetanus. But again, uh, most of the time, uh, the tetanus vaccine issue comes again when there is no choice to delay it. Thank you very much for the answer. There's a question actually for Professor Pires. What is your view on the Italian study showing SARS CoV 2 had prevailed at the same time or before in China? Yes, yeah, so this, uh, this comes from switch samples that had been collected uh, in, in different parts of the world and people tested them retrospectively. and. Um, I believe, so there is this one particular signal, uh, but I don't think it has been conclusively confirmed that this was a genuine uh, signal of positivity in that particular case. Uh, there are also other examples, for example, um, in, in France, there was, I think, a patient who died from whom uh, where clearly virus was detected. So, um, uh, but that was I think in November or, or in December. So, I don't think, and if you look at the WHO mission report, um, they do talk about this. And uh, these examples of cases long before uh, the outbreak in, in Wuhan are really not, uh, not, not conclusive uh, or confirmed. But having said that, it is not impossible. I mean, when you have an outbreak starting in, in Wuhan, people would have been traveling back and forth already. So uh, individual case in some part of the world very early on, going back to November and December would not be completely impossible to occur. But I think the fact of the matter is that um, the outbreak, the initial outbreak did occur in Wuhan. So the the origin of the, the the outbreak was was there, uh, and I think um, you know when you look for the the original source of the transmission, also has to focus there. Over. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just another question. Uh, Uh, there's another question. Uh, what are the implications of getting vaccinated with two different types of COVID vaccine? Is it possible due to availability, uh, unavailability of vaccine? Two different vaccination. What's your view? Uh, so, I mean, uh, I'm sure Nirika can comment, but I mean, uh, in theory, that is not unreasonable. Um, and indeed, in Hong Kong, we do have a trial where we're doing, um, you know, the, the two vaccines available in Hong Kong is the Pfizer and the Sinovac. So there's a study going on uh, that comparing the effect of, you know, mixing those two compared to the same, same and those, the results are not yet out. But, but theoretically, there is no reason why they should be any worse. But I think the fact of the matter, of course, is that the clinical trial data so far has come from the same vaccine given in two doses, right? So we don't have data for mixing and matching different vaccines. Uh, but if you have no choice, um, to be honest, I, I, I would be quite happy to recommend 
uh, a second dose with another vaccine rather than having no second dose at all? Over. Yes, uh, if I can just add, I think in, in the UK also they are uh, doing trials, uh, mixing and matching AstraZeneca and Pfizer, AstraZeneca with the Sputnik vaccine. Uh, and uh, the data is not out. So, uh, and, and uh, just as I showed, the if the infected individuals who had one dose of AstraZeneca had uh, had antibodies covering the variants also. And uh, whereas uh, one single dose did not offer as much as protection as with uh, a full vaccination. So it, it would be important to have a full vaccination uh, with whatever vaccine available. Uh, but if we get the data, I, I think it would be good to uh, see if uh, this uh, how, how effective this mixing and matching vaccines are. are. That's another question. Thank you very much for that. Uh, another question is, uh, what about the issue of vaccinating against COVID who already having drug allergies? Yes, yes, yeah, so I, I think uh, drug allergies, uh, there was no issue at all. Uh, it, it, it is the Pfizer vaccine that uh, gave uh, versus Moderna, uh, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines that were associated with a higher incidence of anaphylaxis and allergies. No such uh, issue was seen with the AstraZeneca Covishield vaccine at all. But for some unknown reason, uh, the, uh, when, when the Covishield was dispatched uh, everywhere, it was given a notice that not to give to any person with allergies, and it wasn't specified which allergies. So patients who had drug allergies, food allergies, uh, chronic urticaria, just urticaria for some random event one day, all of them were denied uh, the vaccine and even healthcare workers and, and medical students. So uh, when actually with the Covishield vaccine, uh, people with drug allergies, food allergies, all sorts of allergies. And, and so uh, when, when people went to get vaccines, even with those with chronic urticaria, which is not an allergy, uh, they were also denied vaccine. So it's beyond me why that was done. Uh, so Spiris, do you have any comments about it? No, I, I completely agree with it. I mean, I think, it, as Nidika said, the, the issue with allergies was with the RNA vaccines. Uh, and, and that is also for people who have anaphylaxis that we really need to worry about. Over. That's another question. How is the vaccine efficacy measured? Is that is the antibody prevalence level directly related to the efficacy? Do we have evidence? Well, I mean, efficacy is, is measured in a randomized, uh, double blind randomized clinical trial, right? So essentially, uh, people are randomized to get the vaccine and not get the vaccine. Then you follow up uh, without knowing who got the vaccine or not, follow up and look at evidences of disease. So symptomatic disease in most of these trials, it was based on symptomatic disease and then they are tested by PCR. So you have a whole bunch of people who have evidence of um, COVID-19 confirmed. And then you look at which of these had had the vaccine or had the placebo. And so essentially in most of these successful clinical trials, you find maybe if you find um, you know, 50 or 60 cases, most of the cases are in the placebo arm. And with that, you can calculate the, the vaccine um, uh, efficacy in that way. Now, of course, uh, antibody levels are also measured, but that is not the determinant of when we talk about, you know, the randomized clinical trial data is based purely on protection from symptomatic disease. In most of these cases, there are a few trials where they also looked at asymptomatic infection. So anyway, to answer the question, the clinical trial data is based on infection, not based on antibody responses. Uh, now, there is, of course, a correlation between antibody responses and protection, but we have to keep in mind that there are, are probably other mechanisms of protection as well, uh, including other than just neutralizing antibody, there could be um, uh, other functionalities of antibody. There's a T cell immunity, as was mentioned, so there could be other modalities of protection as well. But coming back to the clinical trial data is actually measured on protection. So really clinically relevant information. Over. 
So right. sorry. So I, I should mention that. So one of the things that people are trying to do now is to to determine what is called the correlate of protection. So in other words, for influenza, we know that uh, a particular type of antibody called hemagglutinating inhibiting antibody at a teeter of one in forty generally correlates with 50% protection in, in field studies. Now for COVID-19, we still don't have that measure, you know, uh, whether is it only neutralizing antibody? If so, what theta? So this is why, you know, we cannot just uh, uh, extrapolate from antibody theters to protection. Over. Professor Maligi, do you want to comment about it? No, I, I think he uh, gave a very detailed answer. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Just another question. Now this uh, uh, AstraZeneca vaccine and the thrombotic uh, complications, right? Are there any publications about the management of these thromb thrombotic complications and the thrombocytopenia? Yeah, so, so I think a lot of people have put out guidelines, including the Royal College of Physicians, London, the British uh, Hematology Association, uh, UK, uh, so, so I, I mean, those are the two I saw uh, as guidelines. I'm sure there are more. Uh, and they say state not to give uh, uh, platelets, not to give heparin, to give IVIG uh, steroids. They, they, they have uh, they have diagnostic criteria and how to treat. They have uh, include, included uh, other tests like D-dimers, when to do what, and there's sort of a flow chart. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, then. Uh... I think those are the questions actually the audience has posted. And uh, so finally, uh, I would like to thank uh, both uh, Professor Malik Pires and Professor Nilika Malarigi for participating in this webinar and giving excellent update about this current problem, actually burning problem of COVID in our country as well as globally, also in our neighbors. And on behalf of HYPERS and the organizing committee, once again, I used to thank both of you. And I wish that you would continue your uh, work on COVID and keep updating the nation. So thank you very much. I wish you very best. Thank you.